Hey everyone, I am here in Los Angeles ahead of the Player Summit that's taking place tomorrow. Uh, joined right now by Hal Biegas, who is the head of the Players Association. Is that the formal name of it? Because I've heard several different names of, of what the Player Association is. The actual formal name is the North American League of Legends Championship Series Player Association. Okay. That's, that's quite a mouthful. Well, let's go with... It's, sorry, it's, it's North American... LCS, League Championship oh, okay. Series Players Association. We're, we're just using the abbreviation. It's okay. NALCSPA. Okay. NALCSPA. Uh, and uh, to kind of learn a little bit about what's been going on, because this was something I, I sat down with Waylon, Waylon and Jared when they announced uh, that Riot would be supporting this at the end of 2016. Now, about a year and a half later, you know, I think we're, we're just now starting to hear a little bit about what you guys have been doing behind the scenes. Uh, so, yeah, maybe we can start off with your background uh, for those that don't know sort of your work in the sports world. Sure. Uh, I've been in the sports world for about 20 years now. I started off at the National Basketball Players Association as an attorney, uh, left there as assistant general counsel after 12 years. During my time at the Players Association, I had a lot of different responsibilities. I represented players in grievance hearings with teams. I was part of the collective bargaining negotiation team, so I negotiated uh, two and a half CBAs with the uh, NBA and uh, three WNBA CBAs. Um, I represented players in, um, or I worked with players and agents in resolving agent disputes. Um, did a lot of different things. Uh, you know, the job we were a small organization with a, you know, with a lot of different businesses. Uh, one of the last things I did when I worked there was we had purchased a building in in Harlem to to be the headquarters of the Players Association, and I, um, along with the CFO, oversaw the project that converted the building from. Uh, like a really badly deteriorated building into a, a gleaming new headquarters. So, so quite a, a great deal of work on sort of the negotiation side and the representation side in the sports world. Uh, how did you end up getting involved in all this League of Legends stuff? Because I assume you, aside from the sports stuff, maybe not so much of an esports or gaming background. Uh, not so much of a gaming background, no. Um, I was... Uh, after the Players Association, I worked at two different sports agencies, uh, Wasserman Media Group and XL Sports Management. Um, Wasserman's LA-based, XL is New York. Um, there was, uh, I mean, I, being in the sports world, you know, you know what's going on in sports generally. It's just part of your job to, you know, read the Sports Business Daily and, and you know, the different websites, Yahoo, ESPN, et cetera. Um, and so I knew what eSports was. I was very interested in, in what was going on in the space. Um, but you know, had no neither of the agencies I worked with had any presence in esports at, at that time. So um, my introduction to Riot came through. Um, uh, I was contacted by Riot, Chris Greeley, who told me that they were um, looking to help the players form a, a players association, a trade association, and um, would it be something that I was interested in um, learning more about? And, and, and so that sort of was the, the genesis of it. And maybe you can help me construct a timeline because I know that there have the association's been operating behind the scenes for a little bit. So around what time were you you contacted, and what was sort of the the process of, of you coming in? Because I know that the players voted on you as as one of their representative or of the as their representative. Sure. So the process, I believe, the contact was uh, March or April of 2017. Um, there was, uh, uh, I guess, some vetting that was going on of the different people that they were going to um, um, talk to and, and introduce to the players. Uh, I met with the players in early June of 2017. Uh, the players voted after that meeting um, amongst the, the people that they had um, seen, um, and I was uh, I, I won the, the election, um, and uh, um, so I was officially. Um, notified like you know whatever week later I think the election took a week um, and then negotiated um, you know a structure with riot and so I, I officially I'd say I started sometime in mid-July 2017 very good so what what has happened since then uh, because it, it does sound like there's been some work yeah um, there I mean you mentioned behind the scenes a lot of it has been behind the scenes we're, we're at the point now where I think we're really to ready to announce to the world what we're doing and and you know what our plans are for the the near future um, behind the scenes uh, it's 
it's been a lot of one-on-one -on -one work. You know, I've been spending time getting to know the players. Uh, I've had several different meetings with the players uh, over the last year. Um, we've had a, a education educational presentation. I brought in uh, a professor to come talk to the players about finance and and you know different. Uh, um, aspects of investing, um, you know, is something that the players had indicated they needed, uh, you know, and evidenced by the fact that quite a few in the room have their money in savings accounts. Yeah. So, um, so you know, and that's a big part of what we're going to do going forward, just at different educational programs and, and, and um, seminars to help them with their both their on and off court experiences. Um, the next thing I'm working on is a stress management uh, um, seminar, somebody to come in and talk about ways to um, reduce and and, and um, handle stress. Um, so uh, we've also been or, you know doing all the paperwork to become recognized as a uh, as a trade association. There are requirements you have to file with both the state in which you're you're organizing in, which in our case is New York, and also the federal government. You have to file for 501c6 certification, which is a non-taxable entity status. So there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of um, uh, you know work just getting all that in and, and prepared and finalized and some of it gets kicked back and you have to go back and present additional materials. So um, that and then on the player level, uh, I've last um, free agency cycle at the end of 2017, uh, I assisted a bunch of players with their uh, individual contract negotiations with their teams, players that didn't have agents. Um, I've assisted some players with aging issues, and we've also assisted some players with some off the, uh, you know, off the field or, or off the, the playing surface uh, um, issues. So what what is it like? Because I do know that there's a rise in player agency representation that's occurring. A lot of these players are signing with agents or representatives, managers. Uh, for the first time in, in as long as I can remember, I'm, I'm hearing that a lot. Uh, are Is the association a comparable option to these to agents if, if a player wanted to could they work with the association instead do you do you still recommend they get agents or managers what is your stance on you know overall player represent, representation and what role the association plays in that yes yes no yes okay. no. <laughs> so, no um I, I if i don't get all the questions sure, come sure. back at me with any of them. i mean i'm just looking for a general yeah, discussion yeah, right yeah, about yeah, what the role in all this is right so uh, yes i mean the short answer is yes I, you know like i'm I, i've negotiated my entire career as a lawyer so i'm you know ready willing and able to help any player who needs help in any contract or or other legal matter that i'm capable of assisting them in um personally um, and professionally, I believe that agents are generally very beneficial. You know, as long as the agent is is qualified as, um, you know, someone who's knowledgeable in the field and understands the marketplace, and you know, is a competent negotiator and and um, um, you know understands a contract language, uh, I think that you know they're vastly beneficial for players. Um, you know, it helps level level the playing field. You know, players are going against teams that are you know, business executives, you know, lawyers, you know, the people that are, are extremely knowledgeable and conversant in this, you know, in, in negotiations and in contracts and, you know, against, you know, a 17, 25 year old who you know, is probably their first job. So, you know, I think it's critical that, um, you know, that you balance the, the playing field and, and give the player some advantages in that situation and agents are, are very capable of doing that. And um, so I'm an advocate. I think um, we've got some really good agents out there working on behalf of the players. And, and I, you know, encourage players that, you know, at the appropriate time that, you know, they should get an agent. But if there's a gap, they don't have one or um, there's an issue with their agent, you know, I'm, I'm here to help fill that. The Players Association in the League of Legends scene is very different from traditional sports in that in traditional sports, those are, and forgive my ignorance here because I, do, I come more from the esports and gaming background than the sports side, but uh, my understanding is that all those associations and unions for the most part are funded by the players themselves, whereas this is really a thing that was kicked off on the publisher side, the league operator side with Riot Games. How do you balance and, and how do you manage sort of what seems to be a, a, a pretty big and obvious conflict of interest, even if it's a conflict of interest that occurs because of a, a well-meaning decision. Sure. Um, 
I, look, on the surface, I understand why it appears to be a conflict of interest. But, you know, like I'm a lawyer and, and you know, I'm, I'm very aware of, of conflict of interest and, and you know, and, and seek to avoid it at all costs. Um, this is an instance where, you know, there is an appearance of conflict of interest. But in the reality is that's not the case. Um, you know, Riot is funding the the has committed to fund the first couple of years of the Players Association and um, you know which I think frankly I, you know, I give them a lot of credit and laud them for because they were progressive enough to recognize that this was a need that their players had and and you know they felt that um, it was something that was probably going to be difficult for the players to get off the ground on their own so they stepped into the breach and 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 helped facilitate this so you know I think they get a lot of credit for that they also get a lot of credit for saying you know, here's the resources. It's your association. You run it. There, I don't have to report to them. I don't, you know, tell them things that we're thinking about or doing. You know, we're going to negotiate over different things. And, you know, hopefully, you know, it'll never be adversarial. But if it needs to be, it will be. Um, you know, but, you know, there's a good relationship there. They're very player friendly. Uh, you know, it's a different context than you see in the traditional sports where you have like a league that is basically run by and set up by the owners. Um, and, um, you know, they're there ostensibly as the guardian of the league, but really they're, they're paid employees of the owners. So, um, you know, this, this is the, the developer sits in a very different position than, than the league does in that sort of, if you're looking at it from that sort of three-party context where there's like a league, owners, players, this is a developer, teams, players, and it's just a different circumstance. So, um, you know, Riot, I think, was pressing enough to recognize that um, – players having leverage and being able to advocate for themselves is beneficial for the overall growth of the sport. In general, what do you think the position of the players is right now within the league? Uh, there was a time a couple years ago where, uh, in some of my more opinion pieces of content, I, I said that I actually felt like players should have transparent salaries because I, I felt like a lot of players didn't have any concept of what the salaries were in the space and what uh, people who might be better than them or worse than them or all in the, in the game or from a brand perspective we're getting paid uh, it, it in my opinion it feels like a lot of that has changed in the past 12 months as a lot of players we've heard rumors of being able to negotiate really great salaries for themselves and have a, a pretty good position of leverage so I'm curious you working behind the scenes with the players with the teams with the league what your your take is on their position within the the system well I like, I'm a huge advocate of as I said before, of leveling the field. And, and I think that, you know, one of the most effective ways to do that is for there to be salary transparency. And, you know, Riot um, provided to us aggregate salary numbers, which, you know, we, I provided to the players and, and I think they, and the agents, and they, I think, were helpful in negotiations. Um, one of the things that um, I've talked to numerous players about, and, and I think one of the things we'll discuss, if not decide on tomorrow, is um, for to is the the creating a salary database. So whenever a player negotiates a contract or you know um, has their you know an offer on the table, they'll provide that information to the players association, and we'll you know we'll make it available to the other players, and you know we'll have to decide. You know, is it something that everyone gets or, or, you know, do mid laners get what other mid laners are making? You know, like, you know, wh where, how is the information shared will be one of the key discussion points. But um, I do think that, um, you know, the players seem very supportive of the concept. I certainly am a, a, an advocate of it. And I think that that will go a long way in helping the players in their negotiations with the teams. Well, that transparency really helps. Do you think overall that the players have a pretty good position right now in terms of, of negotiation? Not not just in terms of salaries, but their ability to negotiate a number of different things. You know, at whatever salary or whatever contract limit or term they want, or any of those types of things. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's great having a system that doesn't really have a lot of constraints. You know, you look at some of the um, more traditional sports and their limits on on. Um, you know how many years a contract can be how much the increases can be um you know whether or not the contracts are guaranteed um whether or not uh you know they're oftentimes caps on how much money somebody can earn you know we don't have any of those in this system yet and i think that's very beneficial for players um but you know there are a lot of things in the contracts that um you know are very team friendly uh you know the the marketing and sponsorship rights 
um, you know, the, the IP rights that the players have that they are conveying to the teams, their um, obligations away from playing, you know, the streaming obligations that they have to do. Um, you know, there are a lot of things in, in, in the agreement that I think can be um, adjusted to, to make things more favorable for the, for the players, and, and not only economically, but also just from working conditions and, and time spent and, and commitments. How, how would you or will you go about getting those changes enacted? Is it just a situation where you look at a, a contract expiring and you just try to negotiate for more favorable terms uh, at the, the re-up or if a player transfers? Or is this something that is a, a more comprehensive strategy that, that requires players going to owners collectively? Or I mean, how, how will these changes kind of come about? Uh, both. Uh, you know, I think, you know, really you have to use leverage where you have leverage. And one of the best ways is when you've got players who are highly coveted, you know, they need to go and push the envelope in terms of, you know, what they can get in their contract. Um, so that's that's one end of it. And then, you know, the other side of it is you need to go and, and work collectively. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, certainly Riot has been receptive to the having discussions about different contract issues that I've, I've come up, um, you know, come across or that agents have pointed out. And, um, you know, we'll have those discussions. And, you know, unlike in a traditional union setting where there's collective bargaining and, you know, you're required to bargain and, um, um, you know, there are obligations, we don't have those same obligations, but um, we have other, you know, we have the collective will of the players. So, you know, that's important. And then um, beyond that, if there's bad faith in bargaining, we have other legal recourses too. So, you know, I think that there's lots of opportunity to change things for the better, um, you know, both through my direct negotiation with the riot and through individual players really sort of pushing the boundaries. Stepping away from contract negotiations uh, or specifically things that are more related to salary and that kind of thing, there are maybe this is more on the, I don't want to say players versus riot versus players versus team, but you know, the, the players have a certain relationship with the teams. The players also have a certain relationship with Riot. Riot, uh, as the publisher and the league operator, dictates how many games are played each season. They dictate if players get pl paid to go to the All-Star matches. Uh, they they have a lot of different uh, areas in which uh, players experience things based on how Riot Games decides they want to operate. Are, are these areas that you're looking to get involved with? Because I frequently hear players frustrated by either the length of the season or uh, compensation around events that are not specifically the LCS and their involvement in it or any number of different things. Are these conversations and, and situations that you think uh, the Players Association can assist the players with and, and have they already in some cases? I don't know. Uh, yes, I do think that um, these are those um, among those are situations that we can assist the players with. And we have had some discussions about um, specific areas of, of player concern. Um, you know, the change in format of, of how many games or uh, matches are played. Uh, you know, that was a discussion that we've had with Riot, and they've you know, gone back and looked at that, and I think they've made some adjustments to that uh, or are willing to going forward. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's all, it, frankly, I think we're really operating with a blank slate here. It's all on the table for discussion. If, if, it's, an import, if it's an issue that's important enough to a substantial enough number of players, it's something that you know will will engage Riot with and or the teams. With the relationship with the teams, one of the leverage points that you mentioned is if you have a, a big name that is going to potentially sign with a team, there's a negotiation process around the signing. With Riot, it feels like there's less opportunity for negotiation. And feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it you know it's if if Riot wants to change the format. The players don't really have any recourse. They can't say, "Well, I'm not going to sign with Riot," or, you know, unlike a team. So, how? What are the negotiation points that you see in the relationship between the players' association and Riot? In in traditional sports, like my understanding is that things just come to a head, and the players say they're not going to play. Is that is that a leverage point? I mean, how does this work in in the League of Legends world? Sure. I mean, like that's always a that's always a leverage point. You know, and and unlike in traditional sports where there may be prohibitions about when a strike or a lockout can happen, there are none in this in, in this industry. So, you know, if the if there was something that was happening that the players felt strongly enough about, and there was no recourse, 
you know, from the negotiation side of it, then yeah, the players deciding that they're going to not participate in a, you know, in a, in a match on the weekend or, you know, not go to worlds or what, you know, those are all options. Hopefully that's something that, you know, we never have to get to. And, you know, by all indications, I think riot is, um, is willing to discuss, you know, almost anything. And, you know, we'll see how far those discussions advance, but, you know, there are lots of different leverage points. You know, that's an extreme one, um, but it's certainly something that we have. And if, if need be, um, if the circumstances dictated, you know, that's you know, we would go there. If the players supported it. Sure. Uh, kind of rounding out the questions, you have a summit tomorrow. And, and my I'm somewhat curious because I know that you guys I, have you had you've had multiple summits before this, right? Not just one. Uh, no, I mean, there was. There was a summit last. There was a summit last year where I presented, okay. um, and I've had numerous meetings with the players. But I, I wouldn't like nothing. I would say is as comprehensive as a summit. Like tomorrow's going to be a multi-hour day, and you know we'll sp um, spend a lot of time discussing you know things that have happened and and things we need to discuss to, in order to move forward on different uh, on different tracks. So um, the meetings in the past have been. Um, more focused and, and you know less uh, um, less time uh, time commitment. What what do you expect the turnout to be for the summit tomorrow? I'm optimistic that we're going to have a significant number of the players there. I mean I don't you know I don't know that we'll have everybody, but you know I, I'm hoping that we'll have you know a, a large number. The reason I bring this up is just because I I have heard that the players while they all seem to like the idea of having a players association. Uh, their commitment to the association at times feels lacking or that they kind of expect it to be like, oh, the other players will help this and I'll, I'll do this uh, or I'll just, you know, sleep in or play video games. Uh, similarly, you know, having it on a, a Wednesday, which is typically like a, a scrim day, I don't know how many teams schedule scrims on top or if you guys are able to negotiate, like, no, this is a blackout time, you can't schedule scrims. So I, I'm very curious, uh, you know, what your assessment is of the players and their commitment to this so far and also sort of how you ensure that the teams don't get in the way of that by by scheduling scrims for instance uh well good questions um so the tomorrow is a blackout day and we've i've had discussions with riot about establishing you know whether it's one day a month one day every other month you know where there's a, a free day where we could have you know whether it's a players association meeting or bring in an outside expert to talk about whatever topic of the day um, we're talking about uh, so that's something that we're working on um, for tomorrow you know I, I look I, I I don't think it's a question of apathy and I don't know if that's what you were, were, were suggesting but um, this is a brand new venture that you know players probably most of them didn't even know what a players association or trade association was a year and a half ago so you know there's a you know, there's a there's a hill that we have to climb. You know, there's education we have to provide to get players to understand, you know, what a players association is. That it's most effective when as many players as possible are actively involved. Um, you know, tomorrow is is going to be a big step toward um, really helping us grow our brand and our identity, and and um, by helping by um, electing leadership, player leadership. Um, you know, the players are going to vote for their, their executive committee who are going to help run the association. Um, we'll also elect player reps, so each team will have somebody who is the designee of that team to get um, information out and, and get information from the team to myself and the executive committee. Um, so, you know, it, it's a process. You know, you got to crawl before you walk, walk before you run. And that's, you know, we're, we're getting there and it's, it's incremental, but I do think that. You know, the players, I mean, I've probably at this point helped um, in some form or fashion, you know, a third of the membership. And so, I, you know, I think, it, you know, it, it's, it's you make the Players Association a realistic thing for as many people as you can, as much as you can. And I'm not counting in that third, you know, people who've attended sure. seminars or, or presentations. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting there. I'm comfortable with where we are. And I, I recognize we have a ways to go, but, you know, it's it's... You know we're a really you know we're a brand new thing and and I think that um, you know I've been around the NBA Players Association, the MLB Players Association, the NFL Players Association, the NHLPA, um, and you know the, the, those organizations have all been around for 40, 50, 60 years. 
and um, you know we're not even a year old so you know we're, we'll get there it's just a question of how soon so for my last question I apologize I I asked this question to Rick Fox once and he said this is not exist in the sports world but uh, I always ask at the end of my interviews if there's anything that you would say to the community of people out there that are are invested in, in wanting to see the LCS grow and the players be you know receive the treatment that they deserve and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if there's anything that you would share with the General League of Legends audience out there about the role of the Players Association or your role or anything like that, but uh, this is kind of the opportunity here at the end of the, the conversation to do that. What did, what did Rick say that didn't Rick, exist? Rick said he's never been asked that question before. He said in traditional sports, He's like, in, in all his career in the NBA, no one ever said anything you want to say to the people out there. But uh, that's sort of, you know, the, I like to leave that door open for anybody out there. Um, well, that's a really open-ended question. But, um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the support, uh, you know, like I think the players get a tremendous amount of support. They have, you know, large followings of fans. And, um, you know, the fans, I think, are generally supportive of their efforts. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's important. I'd like to see that continue, and I, I'd like to see that also um, that same level of support and, and encouragement, you know, flow toward the Players Association. You know, we're working. The whole idea of this Players Association is to um, work on behalf and for the benefit of the players, both while they're playing professionally and after their careers are over. Uh, you know, a lot of these players are going to, you know, they're, they're going to retire by the time they're, you know, in their mid-20s and have another 50 years ahead of them. And there's lots that, you know, this a strong association can do to benefit them going forward, whether it's, you know, working while they're, you know, to increase retirement benefits and post-career opportunities, um, internships while they're playing, at, you know, opportunities to help them go back and, and get college degrees or graduate degrees if that's what they're interested in. And everything that we do for players in the present um, and then, you know, and going forward benefits the next generation of players that are going to come behind. So if you've got a 10 year old at home who's playing League of Legends and is really good, you know, you should be really supportive of the Players Association because there's a decent chance that that kid one day may be um, a member of the Players Association and everything we're able to accomplish now is going to be to the benefit of that kid and then every kid that follows. Very good. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Excited to see what the Players Association has in store uh, throughout the rest of 2018 and going forward. So thanks so much. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it. For everyone else, you can check out the rest of my coverage of all things esports right here on my YouTube channel.